everyone! Welcome to episode number 648 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. Let's talk about multifunction aperture sensors. My guests this week are Jake Bregelman and Ryan Jansen from New Wave Design. Jake, Ryan, and I explore the benefits, challenges, and the future of these types of sensors and what we should expect for the next generation of multifunction aperture architecture. Also this week, I check out how a group of scientists from the University of Bremen have cracked the code on how our brain waves filter the noise of everyday life. But first, please welcome Jake and Ryan to Fish Fry. Hi, Jake. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And hi, Ryan. Thank you for joining me. Hi, thanks as well. We're happy to be here. Excellent. Okay, so first, Jake, we're talking about unlocking multifunction aperture sensors for next generation defense systems today. But before we dig into the details, tell my audience a bit about New Wave Design. Sure, happy to do that. So New Wave Design is focused almost entirely on high performance edge computing in the aerospace and defense environment. So Whenever you think of big sensors, radar, signal intelligence, electronic warfare, and then sensor fusion, you know, bringing all these different types of sensor domains and apertures together in kind of a network fashion so you can make decisions across different domains of data, that's where New Wave really focuses. Big, kind of heavy-duty sensor processing, but in rugged, edge-type platforms, often military defense, aerospace type of applications. Fantastic. Now, Ryan. Before we go much further, for my audience who may not know, what are multifunction aperture sensors and what are the biggest benefits of this kind of sensor? Sure. So I think to start, it might be helpful to explain what current generation sensor processors are like. So usually you would have a sensor system that's dedicated to a specific mission, whether that's radar or EOIR or comms or EW, you have an aperture or antenna that's tuned specifically for a certain frequency spectrum and you have a dedicated processing system that goes along with that. And so that whole system is kind of stovepiped and special purpose built for an existing mission. Now, when we start talking about multifunction apertures, we're looking at a a new type of architecture where instead of having, you know, a specific sensor for uh, a specific domain, now you create an antenna aperture that is very uh, general purpose. It's very high end. It can cover a wide range of the frequency spectrum, and it essentially produces an enormous amount of data that can be used across domains. So that same sensor can be used for EW, that same sensor can be used for radar, can be used for comms. You put those around a platform like an aircraft and you have a central processing system that has access to all that data. And now uh, you can share hardware resources across that. So your same system can now be used for all those different domains at any given time throughout a mission. So, you know, the benefits that that you can kind of see here, you have a single sensor aperture that you're creating that might be more complex and more expensive, but you only have to create one and it can be used for all those different purposes. You have access to all the data at the central computing system. It benefits things, you know, like sensor fusion. You can access all the data at any given time. Um, Another big benefit we see as well is you can share your computing resources. So in that old architecture, you had kind of repeat computing systems and they might not all be in use at the same time. So now you can put enough computing resource on your platform that can be shared depending on what the existing mission is at any given time. So essentially you're not wasting a bunch of computing resource that's sitting idle for a majority of the mission. So those are some of the benefits that we see in this architecture. Cool. Now, what should we expect for the next generation of MFA architecture? So I'll jump in on that one first and kind of tag on to Ryan's previous answer because there's one more benefit that I'd like to throw in that not 
technical at all, but it's actually supply chain related, which is as you go to MFA sensors and then processors that are these multi-domain processors, I think there's a huge supply chain benefit for our DOD customers, which is they're kind of opening up the architecture such that they may procure sensor front ends, sensor processors, and then sensor algorithm and software applications from different vendors, different suppliers, kind of different ecosystems. That, that's a huge benefit to the end customer that that's not necessarily just technical but it's also supply chain related is how you're going to procure all these different things and get different people involved with providing value essentially into these sensor systems and why i I jumped in there is because your next question is kind of like well what are we going to expect on the architecture and i think those two things go hand in hand which is now you're kind of creating a standards base an open standards based separation between sensor front end sensor processor, processing hardware, data processing infrastructure, and then algorithms and software and applications that you're going to run on that hardware using that data. You can kind of see there's three different pools of vendors. Now, some of them might have this, might be the same people, but some of them might be different. So I think benefit in architecture is kind of going together there. And it's not just technical. It's also kind of supply chain related. Ryan, I definitely want to turn that back over to you here, though, on the MFA architecture in general. So... Yeah. So, I mean, I think another thing that we expect to see going forward and we're really excited about, and it kind of adds on to what Jake was saying, how, you know, different groups can participate in this ecosystem and add what value they have. Um, If this is done right, we hopefully have a system, you know, with the sensors that are covering a huge range of the spectrum. So you should have access to all the sensor data you need. If done right, your processing system should be done in a very flexible manner, providing you access to lots of different heterogeneous computing elements. Hopefully you're put together this system that's going to be flexible enough to evolve over time and improve over time. So that iteration cycle for when upgrades happen is no longer, you know, 10 years or even five years when you get new hardware, but those algorithms can be upgraded every month, every week, even on a day-to-day basis, potentially, and new algorithms that don't exist today or new techniques for doing things that don't exist today can be implemented on the same platform two years from now or three years from now. So I think keeping pace with technology and evolving threats, I think this new architecture really lends itself to that paradigm. So Ryan, what kind of challenges do you see coming in the future here? So I think one of the biggest challenges is just the sheer amount of data that's required in order to do this. So if you want your sensor to be able to do all these different domains, each single aperture is producing huge amounts of data. We've seen up to 700 gigabits per second per sensor or now is what's required. And that's only going to increase in the future. And the ability to digitize that efficiently, do some sort of initial data processing decimation, and then move that over to the central processing system provides a huge challenge. So taking advantage of things like chiplets and optical interfaces that can, that can handle more data, eventually integrating those in the chip. Those are future things that we see being really beneficial, but those are the kinds of things that we need to come to solve those challenges. And then on the processing side, the ability to allocate those resources and manage that and switch from one mission to another and make sure that you prioritize the resources that are available and can easily repurpose those for all these different mission threads definitely poses a a new set of challenges that may not have been there before as well. That makes sense. All right, guys, it's time for your off the cuff. I think Jake's going to take it this time. So, Jake, if you could have one meal with one person right now, alive or dead, who would it be? I think it would be Teddy Roosevelt, first of all. So I think I know the person. What would we, what would me and Teddy have to eat? I'm going to go with uh, probably some kind of wild game, knowing Teddy Roosevelt. I think you'd appreciate that. So let's just go with that. I love that answer. I I would eat a meal with Teddy Roosevelt in a second. Oh, that's so great. Well, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me, both Ryan and Jake. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks for having us. Have you ever considered, how does my brain filter out all of the noise around me? Funny thing, when I worked at a watch repair studio in college, We had a whole lot of clocks on the wall, like over 30 of them. And I wouldn't hear them until someone, undoubtedly each shift, would say to me, how can you stand all of those clocks? (laughs) 
So in this vein, there is some groundbreaking new research out of the University of Bremen that has revealed that it's actually the precise timing of the electrical activity in our brains that controls how we process the world around us. And this new discovery could help us better understand and treat disorders like Alzheimer's disease and ADHD. Dr. Eric Drebitz from the University of Bremen sets the stage for this research like this. In an environment full of voices, music, and background noise, the brain manages to concentrate on a single voice. The other noises are not objectively quieter, but are perceived less strongly at that moment. And what this research team found was really interesting. They discovered that there is a unique pathway where sensory cues travel as signals on the rhythms of gamma rays to our processing center. And that's how we are able to focus on one thing and block out the other noise around us. So this new research shows that it's not how strongly brain cells fire, but when they fire, that's key to how our brains cut through the noise of a busy world. And it's all about timing. It's that precise timing of the electrical activity found in the brain's gamma rays that determines whether information flows smoothly from one brain area to the next or gets all messed up on the way. And disorders that disrupt gamma activity like Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, and ADHD could benefit from this revelation. Okay, so digging in a little deeper. And to put it as easily to understand as possible, groups of neurons often synchronize their activity in rhythmic patterns called gamma rhythms. And these rhythms oscillate from 30 to 90 times per minute. Previous research has shown that when these gamma waves align between brain regions, that communication improves. But until now, it wasn't understood if this alignment drives targeted prioritization or if it's just a byproduct of other changes. Dr. Drebitz further explains their research like this. Whether a signal is processed further in the brain depends crucially on whether it arrives at the right moment during a short phase of increased receptivity of the nerve cells. Nerve cells do not work continuously, but in rapid cycles. They are particularly active and receptive for a few milliseconds, followed by a window of lower activity and excitability. This cycle repeats itself approximately every 10 to 20 milliseconds. Only when a signal arrived shortly before the peak of this active phase did it change the behavior of the neurons. So, in other words, instead of equal signal boost across the board, our brains use gamma rhythms like a timing gate. Inputs that arrive in sync with the rhythm are amplified, while those that come in at the wrong moment were ignored or at least dampened. It's this timing mechanism that's key that allows our brains to pick out a single voice in a noisy room or to focus on a single object. When these rhythms are disturbed, those signals may arrive out of step or fail to get through at all. And that can lead to disorders like ADHD, schizophrenia, and Alzheimer's disease. Overall, this new research shows that well-functioning cognition has everything to do with timing. The brain's rhythms set the beat, and information flows best when the signals align with peak activity in the nerve cells. This discovery could also lead to the development of novel interventions to improve attention and memory, and also possibly lead to brain-computer interface technology that could enhance selective processing and storing of information. Cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
So if you'd like even more information about new wave design or this new brainwave research, I've included a slew of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal if LinkedIn is more your thing. I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me, and our animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com. Or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of September 5th, 2025, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.